It's not like I can teach it to you. Once you catch the vision, you got it. Catch the Vision podcast. Leadership tips, powerful lessons, and inspiration. That's not how this worked, and it's never worked this way. If you didn't get the concept, how in the world are you going to understand what I'm saying? Here's your hosts, John Trimble and Mike Cornwell. Like that in, the, in the nighttime, with all the green. Hey, good morning. All right, welcome to Catch the Vision live. My name is Mike Cornwell. Good morning. And this is John Tremble. Uh, what do we got today, John? Here we are again, Mike. Yes. And we all survived the uh, the crazy water that yes. happened to us out here. A lot of people's attention on North Carolina, but what about Eastern Tennessee? It's um, <laughs> you know, not to go too far into it because you know we've got uh, we actually have quite a good podcast for us, but there's been a lot of stuff that has happened since since we last chatted. I mean, I know for the first three or four days, I was like, go, go, go. And yeah. only really until yesterday and the day before have I been like kind of taking it easy. Yeah. Um, yep. Definitely quite a quite a bit of leadership um, on. Stuff going on. I think it was like Monday. What was it, Monday? I need to go figure it out. I'm, I'm getting ready to do a, a video on the the little operation that we went down to Asheville and back. Oh yeah. There's a lot there's a lot to talk about with that. And I think maybe like our next podcast will I think we can maybe talk about some leadership aspects of it or something like that. But it was definitely uh, a little hair raising and going down to Asheville yeah. and seeing I think really the big difference, um, and people can't really put this in perspective, is like it doesn't really matter how much or how big a disaster is. If it's a disaster for you, it's a disaster. And so right. uh, the reason why here is not as bad looking is because there's just not as many people yep. and it's not as much concentration. Yeah, uh, They have rivers there and those rivers, um, they basically opened up dams and the rivers like went, went crazy. crazy yeah. Most people don't know that that's actually why all the flooding happens because they opened up dams and they flooded everything. Whereas here, legitimately, the uh, people got flooded out and their their roads got flooded up because it's just the rain. Yeah. Yep. And and also, um, you know, I'd be remiss not to say this, but the um, a lot of the culverts and bridges got clogged with trees and stuff, Made and, the then, water and, then go it, high. and then it yeah, it just totally blocked the the water and it blew everything out. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what do we got today, John? Well, we talked about. Different leadership styles. Yeah. And um, we can talk about that because sometimes it's good in, in leadership to uh, know what kind of leader you got. I was I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, well, what kind of pa pastor is he? I was a, a church. And, oh, that's good. And, oh, he he is just a lone ranger. It doesn't talk to anybody. just does his thing. I said, oh, okay. You know, you, 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 mm. you know that as soon as you say it. You know that's an autocrat. A guy that's just got to do his thing. He does that, and he's not interested in anybody else. Mm. So they're each, but then you got other other leaders that are a little more uh, sensitive to others and to what they're doing and their needs. And then you got other leaders that are eh, they're not really interested in that. That they, they want to walk around and find out who wants to say something, and they'll let them say it. They're not really leading. They're kind of just hanging mm. in the title. You know, they're in the title, but not really leader. And then you got uh, the, uh, what do you, what do I call them? Um, the, 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 the good one is the, is the guy that sells the idea. He gets across the picture and then he begins to equip people to get there. And that's a different story. You know, that, that changes the whole aspect of, of a leader. So, uh, you know, being the, being that the first one is the autocrat leader, you know, he's basically, and I want to read this, it says, uh, he has little confidence in his subordinates and distrusts them. He makes most of the decisions and passes them down the line. He makes threats when necessary to ensure that others obey. Yeah. Now, we've seen that kind of leader, you know, that just basically, you're you're whatever you are, but I'm the leader, I'm the guy, and... and uh, it's for sure with this list here that... Um 
at some point in time, probably everybody's one aspect of these or another. Oh, no doubt about it. Um, I can certainly see that, you know, some sometimes I probably would pop into that autocrat and running my household. But that's, I will say a household is a little bit different than, especially a household like my household where you have small kids. Yeah. That's a, that is different than having a household of like 16 year olds and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's a totally different trip. Um, <laughs> where, you know, we try to do as, as much as it seems reasonable of like giving options and stuff like that, but they're very controlled fake options. Yep. You know, you're choosing A or B, both of which are A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, um, there's a need for it because, and, and if you, you understand when they cried like Israel, when they cried for a king, and he wanted to be their king. God wanted to be the king. No, we want a king. We want a king. A king. All right, I'll yeah, give you one. Him. And he gave him Saul. Yeah. Which was said he was head and shoulders above all the other guys around. Everybody would look at him and go, whoa, he's, he's a big-shouldered, big dude, and he's decisive, and he can fight, and he's a warrior. And and they, and they went along with him. The only trouble is, is he didn't have the heart like David did. Yeah. David was a whole different leader and a whole different kind of thing. Flawed. Fell, but one of the greatest leaders in Israel. So, uh, are there any? I mean, it's 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 funny because you say that. And I I feel like I'm always going to try to like remind people because um, here what we're doing is we're trying to equip leaders and help them catch the visions that they they need to catch and uh, to some extent build the resources, especially the idea resources for them to take off. And one thing that I'm keenly aware of is I believe that. Um, Anybody who's watching this has the ability to take the stuff that we're talking about and actually run with it. And some of the things, uh, I'm very keen also to try to mold minds in such a way that they come away with the right message, which is freaking hard to do. And one of which is, is everyone is flawed. So it's like, oh. you know, saying you're flawed and, and you're pointing out and like, well, I can't, I can't possibly be like that because I'm flawed. Well, everybody is absolutely flawed. <laughs> One of the things, um, be a good podcast for another time. When I was in Afghanistan, I learned a lesson. I think it was a kind of lesson that I would learn that other people may not have kind of learned. And when I, when I left Afghanistan, I'll never forget, uh, my primary, we'll say, customer as an intel analyst while I was over there was the commanding general for like all the Marine forces. And so I spent a reasonable amount of time around him and all of his cronies. And I spent enough time, like, while they're just kind of, we'll say, smoking and joking, they're just, like, hanging around, to eventually realize, I'm like, dude, these are these are just just men, just regular dudes. These are not, like, yeah. these are not godly figures. There's almost, almost probably nothing special about them, and yet they're at, like, the top. And so um, that's not to say that they're you know, low or something like that, but it means that they're not, I'm not going to hold them to some magical fake level. Right. And I've carried that with me since I was 23 years old and I've seen it and I have to remind myself because we all got to remind ourselves. Like if you go and you work at, you know, some job, the person who's running it at the top is a man, like just a man. And they're not, they're not somebody special. They're not, they, they fall in those uh, leadership styles and probably there's something in their life, for example, that they're very autocratic about. And no. They're, and they're very no, nasty. No question. Yeah. Even the benevolent leader who works at incentivizing people, he, he does those things that give them incentive to do stuff or motivate them to do stuff, but he does it by rewards or punishment. Yeah. And so he's kind of like a big daddy that, oh, you didn't do it, I'm going to punish you. But the problem is, is they learn how to get on his good side and not the, and if I get on his bad side, they know, so they no longer serve, people no longer serve because, well, you know, he's an ogre, he's a, he's, he's a hard ass, he's a hard head, we can't deal with him. Yeah. But he does reward greatly, so when you're in the mood of his, what he wants, what's done, then you can do a certain thing and you can get uh, an interest in, in what he's doing, and oftentimes you'll have a, a picture where he's going but you really got to get in with what the leader's doing or else. Yeah. And that yeah, yeah, yeah. makes him uh, uh, a, a kind of negotiator to get people to motivate, but he's not really a leader. He's really um, not trusted because they know you slightly get off, you're going to get it. Well, I'll definitely say one of the major 
cons for attempting to, there's kind of two, two things that really come to mind with the autocrat. So in my book, I, I spent a little bit of time and I feel like it actually probably is worth like an entire book, um, about yeah. force and fear and what it actually does from a leadership standpoint. And it is a, what I would call a spending activity. So it's something where you have your, your balance of influence that you've earned and when you when you use force and fear, you're basically spending your balance. Yeah. And the problem with force and fear is one that it works. It actually does work. But the problem is is you have to have ever increasing amounts of it to actually enact the result. So you create a sense of fear. They they'll do something. Then the next time you try to create the same sense of fear, doing the same things, it doesn't work. You actually have to use more, and then more. And more. And I think I said in the book, um, whenever you use force and fear, you better pray like hell it doesn't work. <laughs> and yeah. That way it gives you like a signal to try something else. And you gain a clear the clarity that this, is, this isn't working, so let me try something else. And the, the problem is, is oftentimes it does work, but that, and more often than not, when things work, we want to keep doing them. And so peop, anybody who's run a household knows this. They definitely have used force and fear, and it has had some success. Um, oh, of course. The, the If they're not big enough, if the person is not mature enough, or he doesn't think up that level to kind of come on his own way, yeah. he's going to go under force and fear because he, he got no he doesn't have an option, really. He's kind of... Yeah, that's right. He's like kids are small. They don't know. And they're, and they're going to keep amping it up. And as they get older and older... In time, older they'll older, challenge it. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason for that is a leadership like that it's not capturing their heart. He's just capturing their methods, their 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 modus operandi. Their their. It's really just their actions. So yeah, I'm always key, I'm, I'm always talking actions. about. It's all about influencing actions, actions, behaviors, and beliefs. Yeah. And I personally believe that all of the worth is in the beliefs and the behaviors, because if you modify and you influence somebody's beliefs, dude, they're now moving entirely on their own in a particular direction and well, they're they're gonna they're they will be willing for example because i mean look at yourself right like throughout time things that you've been willing to do you did them because you had a belief so if you have the ability to help somebody have that belief they'll overcome so i was kind of coaching my wife on this like dude you can't just do the actions the actions are the result of behaviors and the behaviors are result of beliefs and if their behavior is out of alignment with their belief, their belief will put a check on their behavior and they'll do stuff like read books. They'll stay up late and like study or whatever. Like they'll do any and everything to get their behavior back to where it is. They will cause their own, you know, they will put pressure on themselves. Yeah. That's a belief. But you do an action, the moment you influence an action, hey, uh, pick up the piece of trash. They're going to grab that piece of trash and that's the last you get. There's no, there's no more... Uh, influence you get out of it. That's it. Yep. That's it. Well, also in that area, you're talking about belief. There are as an anti-belief. Oh yeah, okay. I get that. I'll do that for you. You know, they're under that leadership, but they're also saying inside. That's why I believe like atheists are not really atheists. Most of them are anti-theists. Yeah, I can see that. They're upset with God. Yeah. So I'm going to be this way. Yeah. Well, I don't like this leader. So oh yeah, I believe what he. I see what he's saying, but I'm not going to end up in a chance. I get a chance, I'm going this way. Uh, it's a belief system, but it's an anti-leadership system. And so we've got all these rebellious uh, anti-leaders, uh, people that don't want a leader over them. And so everyone does what's right in their own eyes, and they end up being a, in a pickle, in a problem, like they did, like Israel was. So uh, the leader, mm -hmm. when you brought that up, if the leader can't capture the heart... If the leader, if 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 they love you, you know, we talk about flaws, they can deal with flaws. They can deal with that to some degree because they love you. They, love covers a multitude of sins. You know, they, they can love you, but they also, and they see where you're going, and they can, with their heart, say, okay. If they do it with their head or just out of obedience, obedience is just not enough. I mean, no, it's, not. it's okay, but... I mean, it's great. Oh, this guy's always will be. Well, again, right. the, but the problem is the there's no connection in the heart. The thing with force and fear 
is once force and fear are gone, it's no longer motivating. It's, it is a motivating force when it's present, but when it's not present, it, it there's no there's no motivation anymore. Yeah, that's yeah. why it's not very effective. No, yeah. that's right. And so you have to you have to put ever increasing amount of energies in. It's actually when I realize this, I inevitably realize that every single in every single activity or organization throughout all of history which has employed any level of force and fear to accomplish something inevitably was unsustainable. Yep. It was just totally unsustainable and uh, the end True. results were uh, less than they could have ever had been had they had chose another tactic. They yep. chose the expediency and lack of creativity um, yep. in, in order to do things in, in, um, in exchange for wild success. Yeah. Well, an- the next leader, the other leader is this consulting Democrat, you might want to call him, because not only does he consult with others and with those under him, but he's trying to negotiate himself as well as the group in a way that is, uh, he considers things are negotiable, not hard and fast. They're not cut and dry. Things are negotiable. Mm. Come up with a good reason. We'll talk about it. You know, And that's okay uh, to a degree. The only trouble is, I see, is that um, maybe sometimes there are consulting leaders that don't know where the heck they're going. They don't really have a vision. I it, feel like that's most, that's that's a very manager-y it's a manager. It's he, a that's a very manager type thing. Yeah, he's a manager, and so, I mean, he can get somewhere, and people like him. Nobody's attacking him, you know. But uh, in time, they're going to see. Over time, they're going to see where is he going. Yeah, you know, and that that is a problem because we got right now. We talked about this the last couple things weeks, couple well, couple weeks ago. That that when people say, and we've said this about some leaders ourselves. You know, it's good. It's not, but where's he going? What, what's getting accomplished here? Yes. And so, what is the vision? And, and if he if he doesn't have a vision after a while, eh, whatever. You know, you get to a whatever state. I don't know. Okay, whatever. You know, or you say, I'll just be here, and then I'll have to face problems. But I'm not going to challenge nothing because who cares? Whatever. And that yeah. attitude. It has to do with leadership. It doesn't have to do with your... Everybody will do whatever and hang out in the lazy chair and relax and not do anything. Yeah. But the right leader will work with that and inspire them and get in part vision and share with them where they're going and the big picture of it all. And those people that catch that, it's a big deal. But those that don't, just if they get into a whatever attitude, man, that's the worst attitude to me. I, I'll I'll deal with a rebel every day. One day, a father co- called me up and said, "Could you take my son for a few days? He's driving me crazy. Everything is wrong. Everything is wrong, 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 and he won't listen to anybody." So, yeah, come on, come on. So I got him in the car. I was driving a truck. I was driving a truck for somebody. I said, "Hop in, man. We're gonna go for a ride. Where are we going?" Well, I don't even know myself. I have to wait and call the company. Oh, okay. He wanted to know everything, and and I said, "So you're having a tough time with with dad, huh?" And he goes, yeah, and I don't want to talk about it. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to talk about? Ah, nothing. Okay. I just kept giving it to him, giving it to him. By the end of the day, though, we were chatting. Yeah, of course. Because we had to, I had to get somewhere where he was interested. Because his father drove the interest right out of him. He, didn't, he wasn't interested anymore. Yeah, that's right. And his father was an intellectual par excellent, very, very smart. Mm. But he, he didn't know how to handle a rebellious kid that didn't have any vision. Mm-hmm. And so when we got done a couple of the third day, I said, I hope you know where you want to go. He goes, yeah, I know where I want to go. And his father said, man, he's a different kid. He's got an idea what he wants to do. That's all it took. So, and he's a great guy. You right mean, now. you mean, you mean building relationship and having like an actual conversation? Yeah. He was really changed afterwards. <laughs> and, and it's only because I just shuck and jive with him. I didn't try to, there was no rules. He was yeah. an adult sitting next to me, and we were talking. Yeah, and we got to a point where he, I said, "Yeah, I, I see what you're saying there, and I see what you're saying." There. But where are you going? And he tried to tell me, but he didn't really know. And then when we finally got to a point, he didn't know. Well, you, you, you bring up a really good point. I, not, not to get too uh, distract you off the the topic of styles, but part of vision actually requires continual rework. You have to like kind of get like just 
a nugget, just almost anything, just almost make something up. And then you start to rework it and you find, well, that's not really it. It's, it's more over this way. And it takes time. I mean, yeah, for sure. I would definitely say if you asked me back in like 2013, 2014, when we started homesteading, what was my vision? Our vision was about this big <laughs> and it involved ourselves and yeah. it was confused and I probably couldn't I'd grow things, be self-sufficient. Like, okay, I already, I've accomplished that yeah. in like a lot of ways. So it's like, but it required that step to get to that in order to go yeah. and have next kinds of visions. Like, um, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit that there was plenty of things I was unprepared for, for this hurricane. And I didn't even, <laughs> to be honest, I didn't even know there was a hurricane until I was driving back home on Thursday was, is Wednesday night. And I'm sitting there like, I probably should go home tomorrow because <laughs> they just had four inches of rain. Yeah, and now they're hit saying, on Thursday, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, now, you know, now there's going to be this, this hurricane coming. And so we didn't do the normal kinds of things that we used to do. We didn't like fill bathtubs. We didn't check the generators out. Yeah. We didn't make sure that all the cans were full. We didn't do any of those normal kinds of things. However, we have been doing the prepping mindset and just a general mindset and lifestyle of preparedness since about 2013. Then we started in around 2011. What that has given me is the ability to be, uh, to weather the storm better than most people and then opens us up to be able to go and help others. And so the first thing that we did was we went and made sure that every single person in our group was good to go. And whatever it is that they needed that were their holes and their situation, because we knew like, hey, we need to buy time. We need to buy, because like right now is an emergency. Let's de-emergency emergency it by buying everybody time. And that was things like groceries, water, um, fuel, and making sure, okay, uh, do you, do you, how much food do you have? Okay, let's make sure we got you some more food. Yeah. And, and so we shored everybody up. That was only possible because of, activities that we started years ago that have got to the point now where it's like, okay, well, we have, we have some kind of muscles to help out here. And that long story short about vision, like you have to start it and then you have to grow the thing. And then all of a sudden it, it that walking path will build the muscles for you to do the things that you're going to do in the future. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I have a vis I have a teaching on this, and a lot of people don't agree with me, but there's a big talk lately, a couple of these guys, about free will. Man, was given, we were given a free will. Okay, free will. Yep. Okay, and I, sure. I teach against that. I teach that we don't have a free will. We have a free mind, and we can change that decision and make go a different way because we've been opened up to something that we didn't quite see before. I, I'm free to do this. Yeah, but... You know, five years later, you change your whole mind. You're doing something else. So, so and as I guess you're saying you've got like a nuanced statement about what free will. Yeah, is. I, yeah. Well, I, I, I think that depending on who we're under, is the way we're going to will. Oh, okay. Uh, so, gee, even Jesus this said makes, this makes sense. Even Jesus said, "You are of your father, the devil, and the will that yeah. he wants you to do is what you'll do." That's a good. That's a good reading. I've never heard that. that yeah. makes sense. So now makes Jesus sense. is saying, "You have a will to some degree, but you're under the father, the devil, Satan, and that's the way you're going." That's a very leadership look at this. Yeah, it's very powerful, and a lot of they fought against this. A lot of the guys they still don't believe me, and they say, "No, you're wrong." We we go back and forth, but I'm saying, look. If they had a free will, Jesus wouldn't have told them, you have no choice, you got to do what the devil wants you to do. So he was really saying, look, I can change your perspective and open up your eyes and you'll have a different will than you have now. So, you know, that will is going that way, but your will may change and go this way. So free will, man, mostly what you're under. And the reason why I'm saying that is leadership helps people I, I think of it as sheep, but it helps them see a bigger picture. And it's what I call a participatory leadership leader that he participates in the deal, but he really mostly trusts in who he has with them and gives them opportunity to make decisions and connect with, with issues that are going on. 
but also he's kind of molding them, like you said, it's a process, and he's he's molding them to get somewhere so that when they get there, they say, we got there. They don't say, the leader got us there. No, 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 I don't want to be the leader that got us there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. want to be able to say, we got there. Yeah, we got there, and that's a great leader if he can do it. There's not a lot of them around, but there are some. John, and- do you know why I... I be, the reason why I believe, and I believe this so firmly, and this is why I'm doing this podcast, I wouldn't even waste my time. I'd be <laughs> sleeping in bed. I'd be playing violin right now. I might be working on some of the videos that we've shot. The reason why I do this podcast is because I believe that if you understand and you study leadership, you have the ability to unlock this stuff. That you have the ability to become a great leader, even if you are a mediocre or non-leader now. I truly believe this. I believe because I have I have seen it in myself that my running into the Marine Corps and their insistence, like, dude, I had to memorize lots of leadership things. Memorize. And I dead memorized them. 100%, you know, within like one third of going through boot camp. And then you have to, you have to keep taking tests again and again and again and again. again. And um, to the point where I still even remember these things today. And... I went through and I'll never forget like going through the Marine Corps and being like, you know, very critical of a lot of the leadership that's around me. Um, You could call that from lack of maturity, but still there's a lot of, there's some cultural things about that branch that make leadership a little bit more difficult than it probably could be. But that's not to say there's not really good, if not great leaders, but the, it's from those principles and it's from those foundations and dude, no one is taught these. I, I've I've made such a point about this, especially in my my leadership school, like trying to get it off the ground. That like no one, like, like consider for a moment that you are going to learn all sorts of stuff in your house when you're a child and at your school, and not one of them you're going to learn a leadership trait, a principle, a foundation, a role, none of this stuff. And yet, it is literally the activity of getting anybody else to do something. It is all comes back to that. It is the most important topic, and yet it is not taught. Yeah. So I'm I am I am all in on yeah. uh, learning leadership because it is it is definitely the case that like why even bother going over these these uh, these styles? Yeah. If, if 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 somebody was locked in one of these styles, who cares whether we describe what it is? Because you're now locked as an autocrat. But the reality is, you can choose. You can, the change can happen. Look, at even autocrats have <laughs> leaders. And they have people that can help them yes. get out of that broken record onto something else, a little more lively. Yeah, little. broken record is a good way to describe it. <laughs> yeah, and so they it can happen. I mean, God can take you and put the needle back into the record a little bit more than you go, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so we are moldable. Uh, now there are some people that that you will write off as not moldable. He's just yeah. boneheaded. Well, that's where well, he, I mean, that's where you say the they need to come to Jesus. I mean, that's where that saying comes into play, where they need to get hit with the lightning bolt so need, that they yeah. like totally get it, and then they need to have a total repentance. I mean, yeah. That's what all of that stuff is about, and it's a real thing. I mean, yeah, that is real, and that is a requirement. In order to change, I mean, that's the whole nature. I'm, 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 no, I'm preaching the choir now. That's the whole <laughs> nature of uh, the the gospel message, which is you are. Uh, I'm going to try to throw out my best John impersonations. Oh, you, 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 you <laughs> which is me fo- uh, uh, trying to quote scripture, doing it poorly. But <laughs> you know, you are you're dead to your in your sins, right? Like you were, your sins have totally gotten o- over you. And you eventually realize that's the case. And the only way out of that is the acknowledgement and the repentance of those things. And then once you have that, it's gone like that. And then once you have that kind of freedom, you then... Or light. Or light and the ability to walk in the light, you now get new tools that are opened up to you. Yeah, no question. And every single person can do that. And you know, if that guy in his darkness and in his hangup says, I got a free will and I'll do what I want to... Yeah, free will. And yeah. so somebody will come along, like Jesus, somebody great leader, and say, "Well, may I suggest to you this? And what about this? And what about soon in that molding and in that process, they go, "Whoa, was I stupid? I wasn't even close to having a free will. I was bound." And then they go, then the good leader goes, "Yeah, but I got faith in you. You can do this." Yeah. See, what happens is 
A change takes place. The same, same with Gideon. He was a big chicken that was doing sacrifices inside a, a uh, molded uh, like a cement wine press, and he was down below the top of it so nobody could see him doing, doing stuff that he wanted to do as his religion because he didn't want the Midianites to see that mm -hmm. or he would be mocked or, or ridiculed. And so he did it in fear, and God goes to this fearful, useless little giddy and said, Hey, thou mighty man of valor. And he goes, who are you talking to? I mean, he didn't know anything. He just, and, he, and it's kind of a funny statement in there, thou mighty man of valor. Thou mighty man of valor. This guy was a big chicken, mm. major chicken. He had to be talked into stuff. And then when God said, well, you know, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll win the Midianites. We'll take them over with only 300 people. That's less than 1% of the men that he had ready to fight. That's the, and, and I mean, sure, I'm sure Gideon, I mean, I know I would have said that's not going to happen. That's impossible. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. God is saying, yeah, with, with you, it's impossible. With me, it's possible. And so uh, the one that comes around with possible gets our attention. And that's what happened to Peter. You know, I, mm. bid me to walk on the water. That's impossible. So <laughs> go ahead, bid me to walk on the water. And he said, okay, come on. And he got out of the, and he walked on the water. Now, that's totally impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And so the change of the, the leadership changed him. The leadership style of Jesus changed Peter, changed Thomas, changed you name it. And so, uh, unfortunately, he tried and he worked with a, a, a Judas. There's, there was a Judas in his group, and that's a very sad situation. But it wasn't Jesus' failure. It wasn't. I'm, I can teach that too. I'm not interested in that right now. But what I'm trying to say is that those guys bumped into somebody that woke them up. And that's what we're talking about, catching a vision. How are you going to go toward the big picture if you're not woke up? If you're asleep, if you're in the dark, if you don't get it, how are you going to go that way? You can't. I, I would say this is one of the challenges I have with even doing a podcast because um, yeah. uh, I, <laughs> I, I want to do it. I want to get it out there, but I'm, I'm very conscious of the example that's being set. I'm, I get concerned that the example that we're setting is not the content of what we're saying or even the intent of what we're saying, but the activity of what we're doing. Like we're just yeah. sitting in chairs and we're talking, you know, uh, getting, you know, conveying that we're just sitting in chairs and we're just talking about some stuff and okay, that's it. And then we're, that's a wrap and we roll on. I feel like that's actually what podcasts have actually done to people like far yeah. and wide, because again, what we're talking, what you're talking about there is you're talking about like leadership. Like you see people who are doing things and you will do, do what you see. And so like a Joe Rogan, for example, got like super popular hanging around, smoking weed, talking to a bunch of random people and then all of a sudden people like, hey, that's a good idea. This guy's very famous and rich and I want to be like this guy. You know, they're not really saying that, but that's kind of like the subconscious mind. And so what, whatever random person shows up on his podcast, people just start thinking like, oh, that person knows everything. And what yeah. they end up doing, I've seen yeah. in their behavior, is then they go around and they have the same kinds of conversation that they're having on these podcasts. Stupid. Yeah. This is not, that is not what people should be doing, but no. that's what's being, that is what is being conveyed. That is when, when we turn this camera off, there is other stuff going on. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, if it, one thing I don't want, uh, the draw was Rogan, Reagan, Rogan, what's his name? Rogan? Yeah. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. The draw was he was famous and rich and he was yeah. fun and interesting. Yeah. Now, I don't know what our draw is, but I do know that Honest to goodness, sitting down just chatting about this stuff like we're doing is much more appealing, and that may be the draw. I hope it is that for to people to listen to. But the problem is, is if you get a Roganite or Rush Limbaugh or yeah. whatever, you got parrots. Parrots. And what happens is the parrot can. You keep saying something to a parrot. I had a bird, and I kept saying "big baby, big baby," and pretty soon the bird was saying "big baby," and it was a parakeet. Yeah. So. I don't want a parrot. I, no. I want you gotta you can't violate Jesus didn't violate their free mind, their 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 freeness, their 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 being, but and they did say things that he was talking about, but are a whole lot more. He's even the greatest leader ever, Jesus said, and greater things will you do. What? What do you yeah, mean? That's impossible. Greater Je things you greater will do. Greater things, because he said, Look, 
I want to get this picture in you and, and get this vision in you. And then I'm going to sit back and watch the greater things you do. I'm into this. And that's a leader I can follow because he's not autocrat. He's not in charge. He doesn't discount me. He, he says, you know what? Uh, we can get a lot done with you guys. We, I, I believe that. I believe that. And a lot of times we don't. Be honest with the leaders, the followers, I mean, who's the ones that are not a leader, sometimes they don't believe anything, let alone believe in themselves. Yeah. And that leader makes a difference. And suddenly, you know, I, I'm talking to these guys, they're all about free will and do what I want to. Well, big deal, big deal. You're not going anywhere. You're asleep. Yeah. You're in darkness, so big deal. You got free will. Well, you know, you know it's, it's funny. like a it's, chicken because well, he's open range. Big deal. It's funny you say that because this is a really astute observation you've got here um, about uh, free will and what people will do who are the really big advocates of this kind of free will. Like, what are they? They're very consistently doing the same things with that free will. <laughs> same thing over and over and over and over. So, and it's because, I mean, if you were to use, um, I, I could see it that if you're using that as a justification for something, you're going to be doing the same kinds of things that you would then pull on that as justification. Often, which is denial, because, I mean, I can kind of pull from what you're talking oh, about is yeah. it's about, it's more about denial. And so you're saying, oh, um, oh, I have the ability to do any of the plethora of things because I have free will. It's like, yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. It's kind of like I was saying. Not really. <laughs> it's kind of like last week or the week before, I was saying, like, I don't really trust somebody who, uh, about goodness, who does who has not had some sort of struggle with bad that, that comes from it. And I know a lot of people have a really hard time with that, where they're just like, how could I trust this person to be good when they've, been arrested for stealing before well i trust them about because they know the feeling of the desire to do that and they have strength to not do it it's one thing if you don't have a choice in that they have a choice and they choose not to and the right leader says okay now you got that out of the way now you understand that and he moves on with them and doesn't cast them into the yeah that's right the river so that's right so there's a scripture that says <clears throat> choose this day whom you will serve. Now, he didn't say will this day. Where where is that? Choose this day whom you serve is in uh, Samuel with the, with the Elijah. Okay. And, and and so he said choose this day or with Joshua, I mean, choose this day whom you will serve. They he had to tell them, look, make a choice. And that's what I teach in my free will teaching I did. We have a choice. We can, we have free choice. You might want to call it free choice. I can at any time choose but it's going to take some molding to get me to choose the right stuff. Yeah, that's right. But not my will. My will, you know, I'll make a different choice anytime, at any moment. Even a person asleep can be woken up a little bit and they'll choose something. Yeah. It isn't his will. I, I'm not impressed. Oh, you got a free will? Big deal. You're just doing the same thing over and over again and you're not getting anywhere and you call that free will? Whoopee! But you got a choice. And so when G with Jesus... He does things in our, we have things in our lives. I, I was speaking, speaking to me this morning and said, you know, you are, you're going to be a great old man one day. I'll tell you why. Because you're on the right road. And and the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, when you're on the right road, you may think that you're, you, you know, you may not see all the results you want, but you're going to get there in a way that, that I want you to get there, not in a way that you want to get there. And so I'm, I'm just saying, he says, well, you got to make the right choices. And I'm I'm still making the right choices to this day. It's not my will because I didn't even want to serve the Lord. And you know, I, I didn't it, even want to do good things. I and to and to that point, um, if you, <laughs> I think this is part of the 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 waking up and the getting the mature. If you can't see that you have a choice to make at these different things, you are asleep. You're but, asleep. Because in other words, like the nat the natural thing that you want to do, you should be aware that you want to make that choice and decide whether or not that's a choice you want to make. And yeah. if you're not making that decision, then you're... <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, you, you do make decisions while you're asleep, but, you know, everybody knows you're in bed with your eyes closed. They, they, they're not... <laughs> It's nice, except they're saying, you know, you're really still not woken up yet to this whole thing. When you do wake up, you'll decide, choose, decide is choosing. Yeah. Which way you're going to go? Your your choice, your free choice. See, God had said, "Look, they got to have a choice." So I'll give them one. Don't touch that tree. What's well, nothing to do with the free will? Adam and Eve were sinless. Yeah, but they had a choice. Don't touch that tree. 
And they chose to touch the tree. <laughs> and when the Bible says that they were disobedient and touched the tree and ate of the tree, the word there is they chose to. Yeah. It wasn't their will to, they chose to. That well they they I would you know, taking it back to what you said before, they chose to follow the snake. <laughs> Hello. Asle and that made them even more asleep. Yeah. You know, somebody said, I can't wait till one day he comes back and we're all back to that pure garden that Adam and Eve are in. I don't want to go back to that stupid garden. I'm sorry, but that's, <laughs> I'm, that's not where I'm going. You can go there if you want to, but I'm not going there. I don't want to go to that garden. He has a greater city not built with hands yeah. that we're going to go and be in. I'm okay with that. I don't want to go to the garden. I, it's just not. I grew up in a garden. You know what I'm saying? So I was about to say that's all. All boomers have said they don't want to go back to a yeah, garden. I don't want to go back. <laughs> you know, I want to go forward. I want to go to a greater thing. And he had a greater thing, even entered into the hearts and minds that never has what he has prepared for us. So I, that's what I'm looking for. What do you? What do you? What's your next ones on your list? Before well, the, the better lead, the best leader is the. Uh, Which ones have we gone over? I thought we only went over the autocrat. Over. Yeah, we went over that. And we went over the benevolent yep. uh, autocrat. And the consulting one consults with everybody uh, and trusts in most people and communicates and consults widely with his employees. However, before making decisions, uh, the consultant one will seek views of other uh, other um, people that are in his field that he wants to go for the final day. But the last one is participatory Democrat, which is... Uh, a guy that has complete confidence and trust in his people, even though his people go, why do you believe in me? Why do you trust me? Yeah. And he says, the major problem arises or, or a decision has to be made. All the relevant actors involved in that are called together to discuss the issues and ma the majority view is taken for a final decision. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus said, okay, guys, let's get together and make a decision. Uh, but afterwards, when they were changed and Jesus was died, burial, resurrection, and ascension, they knew something different. They, our eyes were open, and now God's going to say, "Go ye into all the world." Well, where exactly? Anywhere. He was letting them do the greater works. He was letting them do it, and he was in there with them. That's amazing type of leader because now he's got co not only confidence in these boneheads, but these boneheads have a different vision. And you know, like you said the other day, and we talked about this. Once you have a revelation, that's it. It's over. Once your eyes are opened up, you can't say, no. I closed my eyes. I didn't happen. I didn't see that. You know, uh, you know. one friend of mine used to say, oh, I can't unsee that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's true. You, I'll you, tell you right now, um, I'm in the back of my mind, I'm counting down every Sundays that are coming up. Because, yeah. uh, again, still, and I haven't, I haven't made decisions yet on what exactly I'm going to do, but I'm going to be making decisions around that because... I can't unsee those things. You can't unsee them, and you know. Then you gotta. Then then there's some molding and some changing and adjustments that you make. And um, it, it, you know, it's a big adjustment for me to be there where we're talking about mm -hmm. and, and and doing nothing and not saying anything. That's a huge adjustment for me. It's very difficult. For yeah, me. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not trying to make uh, rash any rash decisions or no. the first like obvious ones or something like that. But it, it could be like. Well, maybe what needs to happen is I need to make some suggestions. Maybe I need to like you know, kind of do some things. I don't know what that is, but I definitely know I'm not going to just go back to sleep because I will just start staying home. Yeah, go back to sleep. <laughs> no, you can't go back to sleep. You, are, you can't unsee it. No, you can't unsee it. One of the things uh, about uh, that you said there that I want to make a quick comment on, I feel like you're doing it right when you get the feedback of, why me? <laughs> like that and... And then even when explaining, they're like, okay, you know, they're you, confused. You don't believe in when they say that, you still don't believe. So the, the, I mean, if you think about it from like a logical standpoint, there's, a, there's one of two possibilities. One, they don't know about themselves. They can't see themselves like from a distance. Or two, you don't see them. And so it's one or the other. And so you either don't see who you're talking to or you do. And so if you do... Um, you, you have to lean into that. Um, and it can be hard because you're not, it's always difficult. I find, I find to, um, to do anything when you don't get immediate validation. Cause it's something like that. You might start questioning yourself like, well, maybe I shouldn't be, uh, counting on this person because they won't even count on themselves. That is a problem when somebody doesn't actually have kind of self-confidence. And that, that to me in a situation like that means 
I probably need to spend a little bit of time making sure to, to keep molding them into the vision that I can see at least that they're already on the trajectory of and say like, hey, you are you have made progress. You are going in a particular direction. Well, I, one of the things that I had to pick up on was I'm in a thankless job. And I remember as a stupid new pastor, I got serving hard as I could for several years here in my hometown. And uh, I was saying, who's going to thank me? Who's going to help? <laughs> who's going to bless me? Who's going to... Uh, thank you so much, John. And I was living in my hometown. So prophet is not without honor, yep. except in his own town, you know. And I was Keith's son, Kit's brother, uh, Craig's uncle, yep. this one's cousin. But I was never uh, anybody great or anybody man, any man of God or anything. Yeah. And so I had to learn. Uh, it was stupid back then, but I didn't know that. But back then, I was looking for reward, if you you want to call it, looking for a someone to give me some credit for results, but there was none. There was none to be given. And so what happened is I I began to to, to get, I had to be careful here because I was really starting to get like, well, then the heck with them. They don't deserve me. Yeah. And I, and, and they were going, they, they were not even aware of my problem. I was thinking they didn't deserve me. And I wasn't a good leader at that point. I, be, I believe, um, Anybody who's leading, anybody really needs to listen to this right now because this is like, this is, I mean, this is, this is that feeling of, I would call it kind of leadership isolation. And I've heard John, oh. I've heard John Maxwell talk about this. Oh, yeah. And I, I think he's probably doing good with what he says, but he says something that to me is like kind of really stupid, which is like, um, he says like, uh, he's, he's trying to knock uh, the, the phrase like, leaders fly alone they soar alone and um there's there's some reasons why people say that but he goes like oh if you're if you're walking alone you're not leading man these are all nice sayings and stuff but the reality is is oftentimes you you are surrounded by a lot of people who um you were called to help them and they have literally zero capacity to handle anything beyond their problems and maybe just kind of on the periphery, but they sure as hell are not capable of even hearing bigger problems. No. And that's fine. They can still be helpful in those bigger problems, but not by putting the weight of that on them. Because even explaining to them, there's like, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've seen this. I've seen people melt over this and they just might, the, your best, your best hope is they come back and say, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Which of course is not they they think that's super useful, but it's not as it's not as, it's not yeah. that useful. Yeah. Well, the the leader has to go through a period of not of no rewards and no doing rewards. it because he's a leader because they need it because he's there to help them, not get something from them. That's really difficult for some leaders. Why do I have to receive back anything from them? I, I need to get something from them. Yeah. And suddenly you become a little more self-agenda, selfish, and you miss who, what a leader is. A leader is not getting something from them. You know, now, I, I heard a great guy say, look, you pastors, you can wear wool, but you can't wear sheepskin coats because you're going to kill the sheep to get the sheepskin. You yeah. can use their wool. And he got the, the point was that you can get some wool off them, but you can't kill them and eat and wear their sheepskin. I get the point, but the, really the, what I'm saying is I'm not there just to get something from them. And I had to get weaned of that. I had to get cured that, cure of that. So yeah. now now the I remember a, a teaching gave, gave me that said, are you serving for him, uh, for God, or are you serving for yourself? And that, talk about challenging me. I went, oh, you know, okay. You know, I had to finally give in to that and say, I'm doing it for him, and I'm not doing it for them, because obviously they're not giving me anything anyway. Actually, they're criticizing me. Uh, what am I going to give, what, you know, what am I going to get back? I had to let that go. Yeah. And yeah. that's hard to do because it is very hard to do. you're trying to help mold them and, and persuade them into a certain vision or a big picture or whatever way you want to call it. You know what I, you know what I do in, in, in order to um, at least satisfy that kind of feeling? Once I see that they, that they, like I'll see it like my kids where there's something that we've been trying to beat in their heads for like 10 years. And then all of a sudden they independently on their own way outside of like your influence, they go and they say like, they're saying it's like their friends or they're saying it, whatever. And it's like that right there. There it is. Cause they're not, they're not even consciously aware enough that 
how much you're rubbing off on them in the activity. Oh, you definitely. Oh. And, and so once you see those behaviors, you're like, you know, okay, yeah. I got one. I got to win. It took <laughs> five <laughs> years, years later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> five, yeah. 10 years in order to get that well, win. Well, but. we would call that back where I'm home because we were Trimbles and there was a lot of them. We even had lived on Trimble Road, believe it or not. Nice. So when we saw something happen like that outside, we go, that's a Trimble. That's a Trimble. Oh, I see. You're seeing something of yourself. Yeah. And you, you can take great pride in that, so to speak. Yeah. You didn't do it. To get, if I never get that from you, I hate you. I'm not going to lead you. Yeah, no, you no. didn't do all that. You continued on, and they showed you something of yourself is in them. And this is why this is why faith matters. I mean, those are nice little moments. So when you go and you see them, you know, they're like, they're wins. And But you've actually already won. You just don't know when you won. That's right. That, that's the actual truth <laughs> of it. So you have to have faith that you are. I'll probably I, talk to somebody. <laughs> yeah, I mean. You, you have to have faith that you are going to win in the end. That 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 is like really the level. That is persistence. That's like the definition of persistence. Yeah, yeah. It's having faith that you are going to win in the end. And once you have that, once you have the faith, you, you don't try, you don't need to go so far that you're going to get things like rebellion where you're, yeah. you're, you're trying to, you're trying to pop things. You're just going to continue to, uh, a friend of mine would say, you know, you're just sowing the seeds. And so you just keep throwing seeds down. And at some point in time, you've thrown so many of those seeds down that yeah. something's going to pop. Yeah. You're not, you maybe not going to get everything because everybody's very different. And so they're going to pull certain things, but that's like a, that's a humble understanding that that's their role in this world. And they, their role was to take these certain kinds of things and yeah. not everything. Well, you know, uh, I'll show, I'll throw a whole nother thinking into this situation here. Uh, I have a parent that said to me, my 14-year-old is going to do this and that, You're rebelling and fighting against him. He wants to go do drugs and go off with his friends and go to San Francisco and, and uh, end up in a totally different lifestyle. And he's threatening this, threatening it, and we're fighting over and over again about it. What do I do? And I said, well, give him a suitcase. <laughs> what? And I said... You need to give him a suitcase. You need to give him whatever he wants to go rebel. Why? Well, the prodigal son came to the father and said, look, I want all my stuff. Give it all to me and give it to me now. And what did he do? He gave it to them all. Yeah, he gave it to them. And him. he spent it. And when he was done, he said, I'm a stupid idiot. I'm eating with sheep. I got to go back where dad is and just be a hireling. I'll say, Dad, just hire me as one of the employees. Hiring. And the father said, the father. The Bible says that the father, when he saw him coming, he ran to him, gave him his ring, his cloak, and put on a big party, because they came to the end of themselves. And sometimes we fight so hard for a rebel not to go that way that we don't remember that. Look at this is life is a process, and if he eats up all his rebellion. And one day, and that's what Jesus did with death. Death said, uh -uh, I'm the last one you can't kill. He, they're going to die if they eat the tree, and these guys are going to die because they're physic physically they're going to die. And there's all kinds of death everywhere, and I have the keys of death. And the Bible says that Jesus took the keys of death because what he did is he, how did he do that? He went over and grabbed the key. No, Jesus died and killed death. He gave death what he wanted, and that was the, that was the end of death. The, he conquered death. And he went to hell and rescued people. He conquered all that by giving it to them. And suddenly, suddenly they went, oh, uh, the Bible says that had they known, had Satan known that he was going to do this, he would not have killed the Lord of glory. He didn't know that Jesus said, well, I got this. I've overcome the world. I got it figured out. Uh, and so when the lady said, that's impossible. You can't do it. I said, give him a suitcase and have a great time. And here's some money. And, and Consider for a moment. Usually, when people are trying to do that, they might be they're like we'll say the parents. They are um, they're probably very responsible oriented. Oh, and so then they see they see the child being very irresponsible. But the reality is, is a person who becomes truly responsible. This is back. All I'm saying is the the prodigal son all all of it all over again. <laughs> the person who becomes responsible had be has to be irresponsible. And come to the revelation that it is irresponsible themselves. Yeah. They then take that and then they go and they do it. That's what that's, a, that's why the prodigal son is more valuable than the person who stayed because the person who stayed never found out how to actually manage the thing and and like never. truly understood how to manage it. No, and he never came to the end of himself. He just wanted to obey, do obedience, and he lost the father's heart. He didn't even get to know him really, and that's a shame because. Yeah. 
the the more valuable son now to the father now is the one that already did all this crap, and now he's saying, "No, we're here, we're here, we're you and me, Dad." And that was where he wanted him to be, and that's why he yeah. rejoiced. Put a ring on, gave him authority, gave him a party, because now, you know, some things that really want, like if I take if I take your thing from you that yep. runs this thing, if I take it away from you, you go, "Hey, give me that back." You don't want it until I take it from you. Oh, that is you could. S- and when I give it back, you don't want want it because I gave it back. Now you're okay. So sometimes <laughs> taking away. I don't know why. Apparently, parents don't understand this lesson because that's absolutely. You can watch kids do that all the time. The classic, like, you know, they've got something. Even like this, and then it's like, give it to me. And then like, me. Eh. And it's like, put it down. It's like once they got it. So there's a principle there that that we need to learn, and it's a big one. That's a big one. That's part of the vision uh, that we're talking about here, folks, is the, 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 we we got to get a bigger picture of how to deal things. And that's a bigger picture of how to deal with your re, your rebels, too. And Jesus had 11 rebels, 12 rebels. We, we just don't understand that he's greater than and has a better purpose. I'm thank God he deals with Look, He's not done with me. I, I'm not done rebelling and being stupid. But he still has given me choices. By molding me with the stuff I go through. So, which style do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Are you the great style? Well, I, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to be the better one, the best one, because uh, I've learned that the other ways he let me go that way, and it, I got what I wanted. But it, I, yeah. you know, I got my cake and I ate it, and now what am I going to do? Now, where's the rest of the cake? Where's the more cake? No more cake. You got to go this way. Oh, I don't want to go that way. Uh, that's where the cake is. <laughs> so yeah. so again, once you get all you want and you eat it up, and that's what the prodigal son did. He took it all, wasted it all, and now he's eating corn with pigs. And he goes, you know, this is stupid. Yeah. And he woke up. And once you wake up, it's over. You can't, yeah, that's you can't, back to that revelation thing again. You can't unsee it. Now you know. And if somebody came along the way and said, hey, go back and do this thing and do that. He so goes, wait, no, 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 so I've already been there. What, what you're really saying is prodigal son caught the vision. He caught the vision. And he, he said, did. been there, done that. Don't even bother me with that. I'm going back to where I know yeah. that the good stuff is. I mean, there's a, there's definitely a lot to say about that. I mean, I love the prodigal son. That That is like... Oh, my goodness. That's, I mean, it's it sounds ridiculous, but uh, that's how I know that the New Testament was... Um, divine. The, the entire story and the gospel are divine in nature because those oh no question those kinds of parables, they're they're perfect, like perfect perfect. Not oh th- you know I can see your analogy, but it doesn't really kind of work. Oh no no no, no it, right it's actually it's actually perfect and because like, they're innumerable. Yeah, it's in innumerable numbers of ways. Yeah. It's not like. Well, that doesn't really, you know, it's good in most of these situations, but it doesn't really make sense here. It's like, no, it actually makes sense in almost every imaginable abstraction that you can take from it. No question. And we're talking about that right now. We're talking about like, um, you know, how to how to deal with a rebellious child. It's like, well, it says it right there. That's not really, I mean, I, I guess it's sort of about a rebellious child, but you could, you could pull about so many other things. Like the parable of sower is another good example where... Yeah. The, the problem with um, many people who create like a metaphor or they create a story or whatever, um, in like comparison to the parable of sower, the parable of sower is not really about a farmer spreading seeds. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with like, you know, the first layer is, oh, um, which is explained by Jesus, which is, oh, uh, when the gospel hits them and it's weak rooted and it's about the nature of the gospel hitting a person. It's the soil. But the, it's about the, the soil. parable is so much more expansive than that because oh, it's wait, about, wait, wait, wait. it could be about an idea, any idea. It could be about a vision. No you, question. You, a vision uh, hits you and you have weak roots and you say, oh, this is so amazing. And you don't have strong enough roots to withhold it. And then so you drop it. So th- yeah. uh, that's how I know that those, uh, all of that stuff is divine in its nature because the more you look at them and the more you apply it as a tool, yeah. the better off you're going to be. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, I guess that's our podcast. We'll be here again next week, uh, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We, we like to stream on Facebook. And then um, I've got a couple other, uh, I have one more podcast 
uh, that nobody's really seen. It's our disaster podcast that <laughs> should be uploaded kind of shortly after this. Uh, and I guess if you're in YouTube land and watching the repeat, then um, yeah. you know, you'll see it. Uh, but until next time. Thank you. We'll see you. See ya.